Formula One canceled the Grand Prix in Italy after 5,000 people were forced to evacuate their homes and at least eight people died from 20 inches of rain in fewer than 36 hours. Two dozen rivers throughout Italy are reportedly overflowing right now. Formula One is scheduled to have 23 races around the world this year. So far, no word as to whether the one in Italy will be rescheduled. Um, Now, this rain is the result of climate change caused by the combustion engine which Formula One celebrates. A Formula One season reportedly generates 256,000 tons of CO2 emissions. That's just from the cars, racing, and all the other transportation necessary to hold the event. 256,000 tons of CO2 each season. A commercial airline would have to fly round trip between New York and Europe 227 times to release that much CO2. Uh, Formula One is, is killing our planet and creating the conditions that caused the Formula One race in Italy to be canceled. Formula One, their races are an orgiastic fetishization of the combustion engine, which is one of the major contributors to climate catastrophe, the very same climate change that is killing people tonight in Italy and forcing Formula One to cancel its race. This is the combustion engine that's causing this. Formula One was canceled this week, not on account of rain. Formula One was canceled an account of Formula One. I get it. People like the combustion engine. They also like cigarettes, fast food and sugar. Find something else you like because this stuff is killing you. How's it possible that Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld think it's hip and or socially responsible to produce television shows celebrating their obsession with cars These are childish toys that are destroying the planet. Grow up, Jerry. Grow up, Jay. Okay, your joy rides are killing us. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. 1997, Princess Di was killed after her car, going 60 miles per hour, hit a pillar inside a Paris tunnel. Diana was trying to avoid as many as 30 photographers chasing her on motorbikes. As she lay dying, waiting for an ambulance, the paparazzi continued to snap away. They took pictures of her as she bled to death. Two separate inquests later determined Diana's driver was impaired, combining alcohol with prescription pills, and perhaps her death could have been avoided had he not been speeding and had she been wearing her seatbelt. From the moment her engagement to Charles was announced, Princess Di was terrorized by the paparazzi, and it is received wisdom that she was killed by them. I believe that. I do believe the paparazzi killed Princess Di. But in all fairness, the paparazzi didn't order Diana not to wear her seatbelt, or put her life in the hands of a chauffeur who thought it was prudent to engage in a high-speed chase with photographers through the streets of Paris while he was high on alcohol and prescription pills. Tuesday night, here in New York, Diana's youngest son, Harry, and his wife, Megan, were in Manhattan for the Women of Vision Awards at the Zigfield Ballroom, because that's what the world needs, more award shows. By Wednesday morning, splashed across the media were reports that the royal couple feared for their life, avoided a catastrophe. They reportedly, according to Harry and Meghan, they almost got killed in New York City, during a two-hour high-speed car chase. 
through the streets of Manhattan as they tried to avoid photographers in a scene reminiscent of the one that killed Harry's mom. Here in Manhattan, we were told that they came within inches of a fatal car crash. Now, I understand that Harry is afraid that the paparazzi is going to do to his family what they did to his mom. Uh, So Harry and Meghan's people put out reports that the paparazzi endangered not just the lives of Harry and Meghan, but New York City pedestrians as the photographers, they said, were riding in cars, on, on motorbikes, They ran red lights and jumped curbs onto sidewalks. That's rush hour (laughs) in New York. What what do you you think? You're special? That's that's how that's how we roll in New York City. But apparently uh, they were upset because they were uh, driving on the sidewalk to catch up with their limousine. Uh, You know. This is New York City, and if the paparazzi were, in fact, riding on sidewalks, creating traffic jams, running red lights, I'm pretty certain the lives of the paparazzi were more in danger from angry New Yorkers than the pedestrians or Meghan and Harry were. Because that shit don't fly here in Manhattan, where the official slogan is, I'm walking here. So later on Wednesday, New York City police did confirm that, yes, photographers did get out of control. But we are now learning it wasn't a two hour high speed chase. Of course it wasn't, because that stuff doesn't happen. There's no way high speed in midtown Manhattan is like four miles an hour. Uh, It just doesn't happen. After their event at the Zigfield, Harry and Meghan rode to a police precinct, hopped out of their limo and made it safely back to the apartment they were staying at simply by being put into an ordinary cab, which rode undetected by the paparazzi. So I am rooting for Harry and Meghan. I am. I think they're important. And I think Harry was dealt a set of cards, and he's, I think he's a great man. And I think Megan is a, I think she's great. I think they're great. I do. Even though they're best friends with Tyler Perry, who runs a non-union studio in Georgia that is notorious for screwing over the writer's union. Tyler Perry, no friend of the writer's guild. So I do... Personally, I, I, I think Meghan and Harry should sever ties with Tyler Perry. Uh, but here's the deal. Uh, Princess Di was hounded by the paparazzi. And the paparazzi are evil. But she didn't wear her seatbelt. And her driver was drunk. And he was speeding. And her last words were, faster, Doty, faster. There was some thrill of escaping the paparazzi. I'm not passing judgment on anybody. I have no right to pass judgment. I'm just throwing this out here uh, because I don't understand this game, this cat and mouse game with the paparazzi. If you don't want to be photographed by the paparazzi, and again, I've never, (laughs) nobody wants to take my picture except the occasional mugshot when I'm arrested, but that's a whole other story. If you don't want the cat and mouse game, maybe don't stay at the Ritz Carlton. Uh, Maybe put on a wig, dress like a schlump, borrow my clothes, and I can assure you, you'll be invisible. Nobody will recognize you. Again, it must be horrible being trailed by photographers. Uh, And I'm rooting for Harry and Meghan. I have tremendous respect for them. It's terrifying. His idiot father, his craven father, disowned him. Harry has to pay for his own security detail. Can you imagine a father doing that to a son? Charles has left Harry 
on his own and his, his own grandkids and daughter-in-law. Security, there are no crazy people in America. You're on your own. Harry has to find his own security, and that's really expensive. So I, I just don't understand uh, what's going on. Something's, something isn't right. Uh, they should, they have plenty of money now. They should figure this paparazzi thing out. I, I, I read the book. Read the book. It's incredible the way they're not left alone. It, it's incredible. Uh, I, it just, it, I don't understand it, why this can't be solved. I, I don't. Um, I don't know. It, it seemed, in New York City, we, I don't think we have this problem. We have the UN here, uh, world leaders and the president, wealthy billionaires and movie stars come here all the time. This stuff, it doesn't seem to happen in New York City. People can come to New York City, really famous people come here and they can be left alone for some reason. I don't know. Is it that hard to avoid the paparazzi in New York? I read Spare and, and it's incredible what the helicopters and the paparazzi are, are capable of. Uh, listen, let me, let me make a suggestion here. Uh, my sister and I were talking, and she lives in Teaneck, New Jersey. Let me just try this. Next time, Harry and Megan, if you're watching, next time you have to attend a, an event in New York, stay with my sister in Teaneck, New Jersey. And, and we'll drive you into the city in the Corolla and, and drop you off. Nobody will notice you. And when the event is over, don't go out the front door. Go out the back wearing my clothes and jeans, and, and we'll be there. We'll pick you up in the Corolla. We'll drive you back to Teaneck. We'll even pay for the toll. I don't know. I, I, I don't understand why. It's so hard to outwit, to outwit a bunch of maggots. The paparazzi, they're maggots who can only put food on their tables by photographing celebrities. It seems like it shouldn't be that hard to outsmart these morons. I don't know. Then again, I've never been hounded by the paparazzi. So I don't know. I don't know. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. You happy, self-actualized hum. Oh, I mean, for the show, we want to discuss. The yeah, end of well, that. yeah. Professor Mike Steinell joins us. He is the author of Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. He's also a brilliant jazz musician. We're going to hear more of his music a little later on in this episode. And he's coming to us tonight from Marion, Kansas. Marion, Kansas. It looks oh, beautiful. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Anyway. Hang on. I, I didn't. I'm, <laughs> hang on. We hadn't recorded that? <laughs> oh, you got the applause. <laughs> We got the applause. A couple go. of things. First of all, I'm a member of PDA, and I get their stuff. I need to. I need to. Uh, I need to like log in on the Sunday show. It's, uh, I was there Sunday. Echo? Yeah, it's great. You're an echo on me. No. Okay, because I got another computer going in there. So you? Hey, support, I did something. You support did public? Something. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I go support, ahead. You did something. I did something amazing. I think. I got up here. You know what this is called? You've seen these. A outlet or a what the battery. Ch this battery is tree. called a power cube. Right. A, a, an Apple power cube, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, it powers the computer. I got up here and mine did not work. And eventually I went down to Wichita, drove to Wichita and got a new one. But. I, I, did, I did some, you know, the little wire that comes out here was was uh, broken. Mm -hmm. That's real common. They break. And I got online and, and 
son of a gun, you can take them apart and fix them. Oh, so that, I, wow. <laughs> so I plop, ply up, you know, it's really hard. I had to put my needle nose pliers and you pull real hard and it, it makes this horrible crack and it pops open and then you can get into the little wires and kind now, of... Now, is that I a just, new thing? Because I know they, the right to fix it law was passed where you could actually now open up your apple and fix it. Is this a new thing? Mm. Well, what if you... No, 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 no. What? I think you couldn't take it to other people. You can always fix it. I mean, who, who's going to come? Somebody's going to come arrest you yeah. for fixing your computer? Well, I had but a I guy, think, there's a guy in Delaware who I took my laptop to, and I accidentally left it there <laughs> past 30 days. <laughs> and long story short, I'm a hit on Pornhub. <laughs> I, there's Excellent. some. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't believe you didn't remember Joe Biden was in that thing because I watched those hearings and Joe Biden was talking about uh, the Kurds and the Turks, the Kurds and the Turks. He kept talking about the Kurds. And, and I say, it's just a matter of time before he gets those turds. <laughs> He's turds and Kirks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a turd. <laughs> he never. <laughs> he, he, he That's actually that. a joke that I used to do that never got a laugh. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm part Turk and part Kurd. I'm a turd, I'm a turd. and nobody <laughs> laughed at it. <laughs> I, Why wouldn't they laugh at that? Yeah, I think people uh, don't think that's funny. They're, I I'm going to read go. some jokes. That's why they wouldn't laugh. <laughs> I, I speaking of Apple, I went through what is it iCloud, and I found ten uh -huh. year old folders that entitled new material. Mm. That's just from my stand-up act. And I should read them out loud because some of them are really offensive, but they're mathematically correct. So <laughs> how was your drive up to Marion and what did you listen and, to? Well, I'll tell you what. It wasn't as good as it usually was because I didn't have a six-hour uh, David Feldman show to listen to. Yeah. But I had a couple I listened to. And then I listened to... Uh, a lot of Kill Your Darlings, that book on uh, on writing. It's really well well written book. So to the, the, let's let's discuss I, what we've decided to do is put the show out every day instead of twice a week with seven hours per right. episode. It, it's unfair to the guests. It's unfair to most of the listeners. But there are people who are complaining that they miss the set it and forget it of six and to seven hours. The phone will go to the next episode if you haven't heard it, you know, or it'll yeah. finish the next episode, you know, so it's, it's no big deal. I think, I think the new mo the new uh, model is fantastic. Well, hey, you know, I gotta tell you about something happened just across the street. So across the street is, and we're not really happy about it. Um, this was the first cabin out here at the lake in 1947, really one of the first ones. And uh, that's why we're at Three Lakeshore Drive. It's we have three lots: one, two, three. By the way, it's, we have a lake house, but we're not we're not rich. This is just you know, it's a little town and a family home, and we've we've you know just inherited it, and now we have to keep it up. Right. But and so you have to maintain the house. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I always thinking, uh, David. That's really good, man. So anyway, um, there was there's these trailers over there, and a family showed up, and they down to their kids. They're going to have a few more people, so they were putting up a tent behind their trailer home, and these are permanent trailer homes. But there's nobody here until the weekends usually, um, and they were putting up a tent. The kids are working on the tent, and there's some adults, a woman, and and three guys, and then this one guy just walks about 10 feet away and between two trailer houses he you know how you can tell like when you look at somebody from the back what they're doing you know like with their arms you know and, and then ping he's, he's peeing I'm where's like, he peeing he's peeing like there's these these houses are like three feet apart so he's peeing next to i suppose his house so he but it's next to somebody else's 
or maybe it wasn't even his, you know. Maybe he's. And then he does the hike up, you know, with the, with right. the pants, you know, and, and then he walks out. And I think he was, it looked like from the body language that he was married to the woman and these two other guys. But like, I'm going like, really? He's That's establishing true. dominance. He's saying, this is my name. That's what I do. Oh, Where, really? Oh, wherever I go, I pee just to let people know I've been here. This is yeah. my territory. Mm -hmm. And I will fight you for it. That's what he was. Dave Cyrus and you were funny. That was hey, great. Let me let me ask you about the the promise of nature and peace and quiet. It's beautiful right here. I tell you what. But people ruin peace and quiet. Yeah, there's been a couple of parties, all night yeah. parties over there. Yeah. I don't think you can get peace and quiet in America. I think you got to go to Canada or Mexico. I don't think Amer I think Americans have been trained to be loud and disruptive. Well, you've heard about those the guy that you know buys a ranch and there's nobody around and the neighbor finally shows up. The the punchline is it's just you and me. Right. Right. <laughs> but but I well, you can live like that if you if you you know like I have a field out there and um it's a it's a quarter uh, or a half section of land. I mean, it's not my field, but it's right behind us. So, by the way, we had really high winds on the day I came in. Incredible storm. It's been really dry here, so we needed the the, the rain. But the rain re rained really hard. I finally got here, and then it kind of stopped. And then about eleven o'clock, I heard you know the old thing of like sound like a freight train. It sounded mm -hmm. like a freight train. But it wasn't, I got on AccuWeather and there wasn't any, you know, like rotations, what they talk about with tornadoes. But it was just, and it was, there wasn't any rain. It was just like this wind out of the north. And it was, it was a little scary. And there were tree limbs down. Do you get uh, tornadoes in Marion? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? Oh, you know what I like to do when the wind's really whipping around and it's kind of stormy? I like to open the front door and go, Dorothy, <laughs> Dorothy, <Gale? laughs> the, the, the neighbors seem to enjoy it. And when you do sometimes it, sometimes I'll go. Sometimes I'll go. It's a twister. <laughs> if you do that in Denton, your wife says we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> That's right. But Brian wants to know who your favorite classical composer is, and he mm. was listening to Brahms' Fourth Symphony. Do you like Brahms? And did you watch the coronation? What did you think of the mu the music at the coronation? It was spectacular. It was spectacular. Zadok was the Priest? How great is that song? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Beverly, you know, she sang opera, so she knew all, all those. And she said, oh, they're playing Zadok. Oh, wow. That was, The musicians were fantastic. I got a kick out of the uh, the band on horses trying to play. That's got to be impossible. You can't play a trombone while you're They're bouncing lip around on the horn. <laughs> no, I think they were really playing. Really? Okay, favorite composer. Here, first of all, Brahms is amazing. Here's how I like, here's how I know I'm listening to Brahms, is Brahms has always a new melody. Like in those symphonies, he just spews out a new melody and new melody. Um, Beethoven, <laughs> actually... <laughs> Stravinsky wrote a, a thing called The Poetics of Music. And in one, one point, he, he addresses Beethoven's melody problem. Beethoven was great at coming up with themes and developing them. Da 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 it was he would do, stick with the same things. Brahms, they his melodies come in and out, in and out, in and out. And uh, but my, I think my, it's got to be Bach. Bach is just like so fundamental, especially for a jazz musician. You know, it's so it's rhythmic, and it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's well, how's the word? It's objective. You know, the music is objective. Beethoven is thematic. Brahms is thematic. Like in that era, they would write, you know, Eroica, the third symphony was written for uh, the Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And he was going to call it Napoleon or something like that. And then he figured out that Napoleon was 
uh, you know, a dictator. And so he changed the name. But um, there's there's themes that represent certain things, whereas, um, you know, you can listen to um, a Bach cantata about dying and it sounds just like the coffee cantata. The music is not necessarily um, the text will determine the theme if there's voice, but um, the, 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 the actual music is, is just sort of like very much like the jazz song, you know, yeah. like the, bl the blues is the blues happy or sad. No, it's neither one. It's something in between. It's something more complicated than happy and sad, you know. When you're They're, driving from Denton, Texas, to the lake house in Marion, yes, and you're listening to music, does your yes. mind wander, or are you as focused on the music as you would be a book on tape? No, 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 no. I, w I, w I wouldn't. I don't listen to music in the car. Very seldom, and and it, it I probably should. It surprises me. Sometimes, you know, a, a song will pop up in, uh, on my phone and I'll say, oh, I need to listen more to music. But um, I, this time I, I turned off the, the you know, the uh, books on tape and thought about the new novel and trying to figure out. I, I think I may take a whole new tack with it and go back and rewrite a bunch. This one's going really slow, tell you what. But um it is a sequel. It is a sequel to Saving Charlie Parker. Uh, no, it's it's a prequel. It's, it's not related. It's 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 time travel, but uh, different characters. And he he does meet Charlie Parker, but his intent is to try to go back and meet his father before his father's murdered. And uh, but I but I thought about a couple of things that. You know, um, I need to make the main character quirkier, maybe on the spectrum a little bit, you know. And I don't, you know, I probably shouldn't write about that because I i don't think I'm on the spectrum. Maybe I are. I don't know. I'm, how, do, how do you know? Well, I have spectrum as my cable provider. Maybe I, I do, can, too. So maybe so I can help spectrum. you. We're on the spectrum. So living in Texas, do you have... A, a PTSD from what I can only describe as the terrorism of all these shootings. You know, terrorism is not just the number of people you kill. It's the terror that you create. Do people yeah. in Texas live in a state of terror, fear that if I go out, I'm going to get shot, even though the odds are you're not it's it, you're going to return safely does it See, here's the thing I don't think they do and I, and I don't think I do because I think you the 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 self-preservation mechanism first of all none of us really think we're going to die ever you know that's the, I think that's kind of the human you know um, you know I think you know in, in the end Nadine when she realized she was dying was she was surprised you know about, and she was a hundred. You know, she was 103 months. Yeah. So she, you know, but so I, I think I think you compartmentalize is so sad, but, but it's so depressing that anything's going to happen of any sort of import. How do they cover it in Texas? Do they treat it as a they do a lot of they do a lot of um, talking to um People, you know, witnesses, you know. But do they lead with it? I, I would think the powers oh, yeah. that be would, wouldn't would want to draw attention to a, a shooting, but they do. The, the news media is all over it in Texas. Yes, the, the news. You know, it's interesting. I The Spectrum, do you have Spectrum 1? I don't know. I don't think I have cable anymore. Oh, okay. Well, Spectrum 1 is, is news that comes out of San Antonio, and it's Texas news and they do Dallas stuff, but um, it's the first channel and it's all news and it's very um, it's left tinged, not left leaning, but it's got, you know, and uh, it's, it's it, I was kind of surprised. So um, somebody it's all young, young people doing it, you know, trying to get started in broadcasting, but it's very definitely 
um, it comes out of Austin, San Antonio, that area, which is, for, you know, Austin's pretty liberal, you know. Right. Well, if you're doing legitimate, we, when I had Spectrum, Spectrum Channel One had local New York City yeah. news, and it was competent. It was by the book journalism, mm-hmm. which ha- has to be left of center because if you're dealing with the truth and facts, how you you have you have the right, which is in cloud cuckoo land, and you have the the truth. So. Yeah. When, when, when I answer your question, I don't, you know, like I personally haven't changed my behavior. Once in a while, I tell you when I uh, when somebody's acting crazy in traffic, you know, then I go like that's 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 a dangerous person. Mm-hmm. Somebody doing, you know, that's that's a person that's dangerous, and they probably have a gun. Right. You know that the open carry thing in. In Denton, do you see you know, people carrying pistols? Yes, yes. You see people carrying AK. You know, like there was a car show, and these guys were walking around. It was right after Open Carry uh, came out, and they're walking around with their automatic weapons over there. You know, and they walk right next to you, and the, and the barrels, you know, could shoot you in the foot if it went off. I'm not sure if they're loaded or not, but. It's a horrible thing. I thought your thing on uh, mental health was right on, you know. Oh, thank you. Um, they just can't. That's uh, it's such a uh, empty exercise to to go that way. How know? does it get to this point where, where Greg Abbott is the two and Ted Cruz are tools of the NRA? It's not like Beto O'Rourke didn't do well. I mean, it, Texas is there are a lot of Democrats in Texas. There are a lot of them own guns, David. Even the Democrats own guns. Yeah, I don't think you can. No, I think people who would vote for uh, Joe Biden and, and Beto O'Rourke own guns, you know. But um, I just yeah, it's it's even hard to even I hate to even talk about it because it seems so hopeless <clears throat> you know that for a solution you just wonder like what amazingly horrible thing has to happen it has happened it and happens over and over again uvalde it, it happened uvalde is and and the response is more i'm laughing at the stupid more guns there are people who see uvalde and say the, the reason that happened is the more guns and when you clearly see the tapes of the the first responders being terrified of going in there. Yeah. No, we, need, we need more people with guns. Well, more people, that means more frightened people with guns. It's, uh, hey, uh, the president of the United States is about to join us. So why don't we do this? Let me let me turn him t- turn him off for one second and play your song. And then, yeah, then I want to listen to. And uh, then we're going to have the president of the United States join us. This is this called. Is named Donald or Toenail? Uh, it's Donald. Oh, okay. This is Ants in the Kitchen? Yes. And you know, I, you've talked about with Alaminsky a lot of the main issues of the day. And I, I still think this is one of the most important ones. Okay, let me just check the sounder. Can you hear this? Yes, very good. Okay. Uh, here we go. This is. Music from Professor Mike Steinell, Ants in the Kitchen. Featuring Rosanna Eckert. They come to my place. My kitchen's clean, my counter's made of granite, but I can't really show my face. 
Cause I've got ants in the kitchen Ants in the kitchen Ants in the kitchen Ants in the kitchen They say the host, except that the host uh, has to start the video for me, David. David, I love it. Jazz for white people. Unthreatening jazz. This is the good, this is one of the good jazzes. <laughs> Mr. President, uh... Okay, Trump. Thelonious Trump. I had an uncle Thelonious Trump. <laughs> he was good too. He was. Well, he was one of. He was a virtuoso, virtuoso in in his day. Please welcome the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, Mr. President, welcome. It's been a big week for you. Uh, do you know Professor Mike Dad. Steinel? He's a jazz trumpeter, pianist, author of The Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble and Building a Jazz Vocabulary. Have you uh, ever met Professor Mike Steinel? Never, never met him. Never met him. He's a professor, so his professors, they're all liberal. Right. Very sad, David. Do you, do you think jazz should be taught in our public schools? Of course jazz should be taught in our public schools, David. Jazz was invented by, you know who? Who? Blacks. <laughs> yeah, that's... 
everyone loves jazz, David. You know what CRT is, David? Uh, critical race theory. Critical race theory, David. All that nonsense, David, could just be replaced by a simple do 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 all the crybaby stuff about slavery and this and that. There's one cure for that, the universal language of do 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 the good kind of jazz, David, the unthreatening kind, played by white men. You like jazz that's played by white men. Weather report type jazz, David. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. President, you've had a pretty remarkable week, and thank you for... Well, such a sad thing, such a sad thing what happened, David. <laughs> for our country, David. The country's a laughing stock, David. We're turning into a third world country, David. Before your very eyes, people are pouring into this country. Soon it's going to be a fourth world country, David. <laughs> then a fifth. People laugh, but four, and then before you know it, a seventh world country. <laughs> I don't even know how dark people can get, but we're going to find out. <laughs> we're going to learn very soon, David. All we had to do was reelect me. But the election was rigged. Mm -hmm. So we get Sleepy Joe. Sleepy Joe getting out of Afghanistan. I was going to get out with strength, David, with dignity, David. And instead, that was probably the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. And until your show. Until tonight, we wasted 45 minutes talking to a jazz professor Jew. I don't think he's Jewish. Sounded Jewish. Well, he's a professor. Exhibit A, David, he's a professor who likes jazz and he's white. That makes him a Jew. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump.